if nothing else in the world, we should be able to sit down and say, there's something difficult or challenging or interesting that we need to have a conversation about. Business of Architecture, episode 387. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Wendy dunham Tita, Principal at Page. Early in her career, Wendy worked for the residential practice of Ike and Kleigerman in New York, and in 1995, she became the vice president of the firm Page, Sutherland Page in Austin. Following that, in 2002, she then set off and operated her own boutique practice in Austin and Hood River, Oregon. And then she returned to Page in 2013 as principal and director of their interior architecture division of Page, which she's been running for about eight years now. She was also the 2018 board president of the AIA Austin and currently chairs the group's Women in Architecture Committee. In this episode, Wendy shares insights into her role in Page and the root of her success as a leader. And we also discuss the importance of communication and transparency in dealing with your clients and within the firm to nurture a more collaborative environment and bridging the connection between design and people. So sit back, relax and enjoy Wendy Dunham Tita. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Wendy, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you for having me. My absolute pleasure. Now, you run the interior architecture division of Page Sutherland Page, and you've been doing this for about eight years. Am I correct? Yes, I have. I wear two hats, actually. I lead our interior architecture practice, and I also help lead our housing and hospitality market sector. So. Great, great. Okay, and we can talk about those two hats um, shortly, and what and what it involves, and also your expertise in in real estate and some of the ways that you uh, have have approached clients or nurtured those sorts of relationships. Um, you are the chair of Women in Architecture. Is that correct? I oh. helped found the Women in Architecture Committee in Austin, and I created a an exhibit and a lecture series. And that was actually years ago. And one of the very best things is to see how much it's grown since it started. So, and I help, um, I'm the chair of the fellows committee for the AIA Austin. Great, fantastic. And you were the, uh, you were the board president in 2018. I understand as well of AIA Austin. I was, yeah, it's a great group. I've learned a lot from my colleagues there. Amazing. Great. So I think the first, the first question is you could, if you could tell us a little bit about your, um, your role at Page and how you got there. Cause it's an, I understand it's an interesting career journey that you've had. This is, this is the, the second stint, if you like, of working at Page. And in between that, you actually ran your own practice as well. I did. Yes. You know, I, I came from a fairly traditional architectural education background. Mm-hmm. I went to the University of Texas at Austin. I, it was a, a fantastic program and my first job in New York kind of blew my mind and actually created a different way that I saw my role as an architect. Mm-hmm. The practice that I worked for was more of a small boutique firm that did everything from site selection and tromping around and figuring out the very best orientation for a, a gorgeous home. Yep. To, to the hinge on a cabinet. And for me, that notion of the really holistic design experience and process expanded my view of what making was as a designer. And that broader view led me to thinking that I might actually want to start a business building furniture. Mm-hmm. So I moved to Austin in 95, thinking that I was actually going to start a furniture fabrication business. And I had some commissions. It was a, I moved here because it was a more affordable place to make than New York. Right. And, and I had a good network of other makers that I wanted to, to start working with. And actually very quickly realized that I missed the spaces that the furniture was going in. And that 
um, smaller role as an architect and a, and a designer uh, was too constrained. So that was an interesting early lesson. Paige, which is our, our name since 2014, uh, had been Paige Settle and Page, and they hired me and said they were looking for a bridge person between architecture and interiors. And that seemed like kind of an interesting role. Oh. I've always been more of a generalist than a um, sort of, you know, specialized surgeon. And I really appreciated that kind of general view. And I love connecting. And so that idea of creating a practice based on connecting inside and outside was really compelling to me. So I was at Page for six years and really enjoyed that work. I worked on some enormous and beautiful projects, the airport in Austin and larger and kind of institutional uh, type buildings. And then I realized that I was looking for something that I had a bit more control over the whole project. Yeah. And I wanted to, cre- I wanted to see what kind of practice I would create if I were to make a sustainable business model for myself. So I had a small firm for 11 years. I learned so much about myself and what I care about. And I also really did get to experiment with different ways of delivering design and working really closely with artists and artisans and taking the things that I wanted to do as a furniture maker and turn those into how we build architectural pieces and do a little bit more of design build and kind of reimagine the delivery process. I think the traditional architecture contractor relationship is actually not that great for innovation or for delivering really beautiful, precise quality because there's so much that's a a sort of transactional um, chain of command. And I really enjoyed that time of getting to explore different ways of delivering at a scale I could control. And I also really enjoyed creating a practice based on what I would call a sustainable model of working, which didn't have to do with environmental sustainability as much as it did, how can people be sustained in their work and not be burned out? And, and, And how could alternate ways of thinking about a person's work day or work year, um, kind of feed into the health of, of architecture. So that was a fantastic exercise. I really enjoyed it. Um, that firm it was, you know, the middle of it was during a massive recession. So our firm was anywhere between sort of four and 11 people over those years. And then Paige was looking to kind of reimagine itself as a firm and look at different types of leadership and different types of project delivery. And it, happened to coincide with, I'd given myself a year to reimagine what the next chapter was, whether that was bringing on a business partner or merging or taking what I'd learned and going to work for somebody else. I, the thing I learned about that process is that running your own firm takes so much outside of the act of designing. And I really, in my heart, I wanted, I, I appreciate that entrepreneurial business mindset, but I didn't want it to be 100% of my activity. I still, in my heart, wanted to have that connection to making. So I was reading Chip and Dan Heath's book, Decisive, which for any of your people who are, I don't know, they are my gurus. They don't know it, but someday I'm going to meet those men and just give them an earful of how fantastic their writing is. Um, But I had given myself a year to sort of think through what that next decision point was. And Paige also was in a transition mode. And so that um, coincided with us um, working together again. I've been here since the end of 13 Mm. and was so excited that they were willing to embrace some of the things I had learned in that alternate practice model and bring it into the firm and how we're working today. Well, it's an interesting move, actually, because we don't often see that kind of career trajectory. Often we see, you know, coming from a larger practice and then going down, um, starting up your own practice and then continuing on that, on that furrow, but to, to, to kind of go out, come back in is a really interesting kind of perspective that you'll see in the, in the business. Um, what was some of the, the kind of insights that you were able to bring to page having run your own practice? And what were some of the things that you were, you were really pleased to not have to do anymore, if you like. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I really love about the work at Page is the level of complexity. 
Right. And working at the scale of a city, working at the scale of a master plan. And in that boutique practice, the work individually was lovely, but I missed that larger, really complex, connected piece. Um, and so it was nice to, to be able to re-engage that. Mm. At the same time, there were ways of delivering design where at a large practice, you have these, you know, three volumes of drawings <laughs> and a volume of specifications and this kind of delivery method, which is you don't necessarily know who's building your project until so much farther down the line and the ability to control beautiful moments within some of those buildings can be hampered by the unknowing of the maker. And so one of the things that um, we started doing is really talking, having that conversation very transparently with our clients and identifying early on, you know, there's so many delivery methods and and this, I'm not talking about design build, but I'm talking about identifying early on and really transparently talking about here are our goals, mm -hmm. here's the maker who can deliver on that, here's our budget, and, and really then compartmentalizing whatever that moment is, whether it is you know, the entire, if it's for the facade or if it's an interior, if it's the, the, the three major materials in that lobby, really identifying that craftsman early on or that subcontractor yeah. and having a conversation with them so that you have so much more control over the, what is delivered when you're engaging that maker early on. Yeah. And I think because Paige had done so much institutional work for so long, that was a little bit of a new thing. Um, the other thing that we did in my firm is we, we looked at what is the most profitable component of our work. And the most profitable component of our work, the highest percentage, and was also the place where we felt like we were in the most control of design delivery. And that was creating custom furnishings and delivering turnkey procurement of art uh, furniture, accessories, that sort of the final layer of that. Yes. And larger firms are sometimes afraid of that or feel like it's a little bit fluffy. But if you look at some of the most fantastic architecture that we consistently go back to, it is obsessive about every moment and not letting some other person who doesn't really know what the beating heart of the project is yeah come into it at the end and add things that aren't part of that single narrative. So, so the idea of being able to deliver that um, has also been a completely new service that the firm is doing now. And, um, and I did not like the way that those were delivered in other interior architecture and design firms. I felt like there was a lot of unknowns and the client didn't know if they were getting the best value because of how the business of that was structured. Yes. So we created this incredibly transparent model for delivering that. Um, and at any point in time, a client can ask to see our books and they will know exactly what they pay, what they paid us that is fair and that we feel good about, but there isn't any of this like, well, how did, what did that cost? And um, I think that level of, trust creation allows them to even give us more leeway as designers because they know that we have their best interests and in a project at heart. Is that transparency, does it come across in other parts of the firm? It absolutely does. I, I think that we talk up to our clients about what is their business goal mm -hmm. and how is their business goal met and then how does the design and the delivery of the de design feed into it? And, and that can be as simple as, you know, the AIA has a contract structure. We have these very traditional percentages yeah. of what we get paid at each stage. But a developer has a totally different structure of when they get paid. And so there's that upfront cost versus that back end cost. And sometimes those work out just fine. And sometimes they're in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have that conversation so that if we need to adjust doing less so that they can make their business model work, we can be much clearer as opposed to just thinking that they're too cheap to pay whatever we think it would cost. Yeah. So that, that leveling of understanding, I think is incredibly important.
What sort of um, work do you do to understand the client's business agenda for their, both for a, a particular project or how you're discussing here with a, with a developer, their own internal mechanisms in their business? How does, how does Paige kind of, what sorts of questions do you ask, if you like? We ask really dumb ones. I mean, it's, this is not rocket science. It is so, um, you know, it's literally sitting down and saying, what does success look like to you? Not just at the end, but at each phase. And that question is, um, can be really eye-opening. And then the other part of that transparency is uh, about cost. And, you know, so much of the time, a client doesn't want to give you their budget because they're afraid you'll spend all of it. (laughs) And and so then there's this conversation of like, well, how do we design to the budget if we don't know what it is? Or how is that budget created? And is it realistic? And can we maybe make sure we have those alignments early on? And, you know, if we we try and approach those conversations as not we're about to talk about something that is really hard and awkward, we try and approach that conversation as we want you to be successful and our success is your success. So how can we engage every component that feeds into your decision-making, you know, factor. And so I, we don't have a form that is like a process. It's really as it's opening the dialogue as early as we can. That's a very interesting question you you posed there is how's your budget come about where does it where does it come from and often we might uh, uh, as architects forget to ask that question so that we're actually and that, that actually we're allowed to um quiz and understand where the client's budgets and expectations have actually been set because then that's a that's a dialogue there that can be opened up where we're able to actually provide a lot of value and even be able to structure our own services to match when their kind of fees and budget allowances are actually coming into coming into play, like you were d- discussing. Um, in terms of the, how Page acquires clients, how does how does that differ, for example, from the sort of processes that you were involved whilst working for yourself, and the kind of insights that you've gotten, or the the learnings and difference of how clients get onboarded into practice. Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, I think almost everybody would say the very best way to get a client is a referral. Yeah. Now, I know this person and they did fantastic work and you should hire them. I mean, that's just, that's, I think, the absolute kind of base line of, of that kind of thinking. But what's interesting is that, you know, at a smaller firm, I got so much work through collaboration because I was interested in doing work that was kind of larger than I was. Mm. And so a lot of that business came from, from colleagues. And I, I, I love collaboration. I, I would never be that sort of single person, uh, you know, working in my quiet place. Like my energy comes from creating that with other people. And so a lot of my work as a, as a smaller kind of boutique practice was, was created with colleagues either finding a great partner to bring in or, you know, being a great partner to somebody else. So that has happened somewhat at Page through kind of some of our larger joint ventures where there are projects where we each have this deep well and we come together and, you know, do some, do an airport or, you know, a kind of larger civic uh, type uh, infrastructure building. But Page is also probably has 80% of its work that's repeat clients. And a lot of, I mean, I, I started working with a client 22 years ago when I first was at Page. We've done a dozen projects together. Many of them look completely different. We're always solving a different problem. Um, but that level of trust mm. has also been uh, incredibly rewarding. So that's a little bit different as well. What what are some of the uh, kind of keys, if you like, of maintaining a relationship over that length of time? One of them goes back to what we discussed, which is transparency. And and also, I think we ask a lot of, um, you know, with developers, in a way, there's a product that you're designing. 
And that's different some ways than in sort of like an institutional project where you're creating something that is a civic fabric uh, moment. But for a developer who's doing maybe multifamily or a hotel, there's a lot of that that's, that's product design and evolution. And so understanding what that developer is needing and, and thinking through that with them, what is that product? What is that market that they're trying to meet? And how can we help shape that along the way is, is I think why we're a good partner. We don't come in with an idea of what we think their product is. We talk to them a lot about what their business and what their product is and how then we can use design to meet that. Yeah. And, and then um, we really do also always try to bring something that is fresh and unexpected so that that relationship, even though it's been going on for so long, is still evolving. I think innovation is so important and it's hard in architecture because architecture is slow to evolve. Um, there's some permanence in, in that built environment that I don't think moves as quickly as maybe fashion or food or yes. you know some other things. It's interesting that you're talking about you particularly when you're working with um, developer clients that you're seeing the the service, if you like, is helping them develop a, a product. Can you give us some, some examples of, of how you might do that or, or or the sorts of strategies that you might work with the, with a client to help them understand their own business agenda, if you like, on a project? Well, sure. You know, one of the things that I think, if we're talking about space as a product, um, I gave a talk last fall about how architects can help clients make good design decisions. And the premise of that is that architects are sometimes terrible at thinking the tools we are using and that we read are actually what our clients are using and clients are reading. (laughs) They, they're, we, it's not just Arcus speak and that language that can kind of be going sideways. It's sometimes just the drawings that we use. So In that discussion of product and thinking about the the evolution of that, one example is really trying to talk about the specific moments of the the touch points that are going to engage their resident or their guest. And, And not just what do you want them to do or buy or lease, but how do you want them to feel and what do you want them to say when they are sharing that story of your project with somebody else. And so there's a very kind of left brain, right brain conversation that we are continuously having that are the sort of the head and the heart. It's like, what boxes do we need to check? And then how do you want that guest to feel about that? Um, And I think one of the things that we continuously ask in that is what is the community that's getting created in that product dialogue, you know, not, and I, and I don't, I don't, some people might think product is a four letter word. I don't, I don't have that sense of it for myself. I see it as that there's a community that we also use that to create a community. So the conversation also with the client is within this hotel or within this residence, what's the larger community context that you want to create within that individual moment. So we are obsessive about the details of a beautiful residence of a, you know, a condo and what makes it unique and special and attentive. And what have we learned from our single family residences that we bring into our multifamily? Those kinds of things are at that level of product design. But then there's also thinking about the context of that individual moment within a larger community and what the developer is trying to create there. Brilliant. Uh, it, it, just going back to this idea of transparency and how and that tra- the importance of transparency with clients. How important is the notion of transparency within the office itself? So, in terms of kind of higher level strategic conversations or the things that the leadership team are discussing, or even the financials of the firm, and how that's kind of communicated internally. Yeah, it's. It is incredibly important and I think empowering. So an example of how we live that is that we take our proposals and 
and ask our team to read our proposal and our contract to really understand what have we obligated ourselves to? What are we being paid? What are the stages of that? And, and I, do, I don't, when we started doing that more, like the staff, the designers, the architect, you know, everybody it was, it's, it's exciting to be able to know like what does success look like for us mm. and what does it mean? What beyond the sort of schematic design, design delivery, like within that, what are we really obligated to do? And, and then also if, if a client asks for something that's outside of that contract, it's easier to really transparently say, well, you remember this is, this is how we've structured our agreement with you. And this is an important thing to you. And we're very happy to do that. Um, but to not kind of back into it in an accidental way, people deal with new information so much better if it's sort of fresh and clear versus coming into it and some like, oh, by the way, do you remember a month ago when you asked us to do that and we did it? Well, now we have to charge you. You know, those, those kinds of things are, never feel good to anybody. So yeah. part of that transparency is just helping the team know what we are, what we are, um, the agreement we're creating with our clients. Now that, um, that's, that's quite courageous in many ways. Um, what, what was the, the, the thinking behind introducing that? Do you, or do you remember a time before you did that and what it was like and what kind of led up to the decision to kind of be that transparent with the team? I don't think there was an intention to withhold. It was yeah. more of realizing, wait a minute, this could be so much better if we did share that. Um, so I think that's one of the things is, you know, I mentioned this before, I think architecture as a practice, as a professional service is, has so many kind of legacy um, business modes. And I think just rethinking what that looks like takes, takes some effort um, yeah. because we're so much in the project yes. and we don't always yes. step outside of it and look at how we're doing the work when we're just in the work. And so I think that we are thinking more and more about how we're doing the work and how we can improve that. Um, at, at Page, how do you, and I'm particularly as a, you know, as a role in, as a principal, how do you split your time up between the kind of strategic thinking and the looking at how you're delivering the work versus the actually being engaged with the project delivery? It's, it really varies. Um, you know, we, we very much value that there are design leads, there are delivery leads, and there are, are kind of strategic and management leads. And, and those, all of those voices are, are incredibly important. So we have a lot of, of collaboration around that. Um, you know, for me personally, I, I love being so connected to certain projects that it informs the ones where I'm really just helping at a strategic level. I feel like I want to stay close enough to the work in certain places that I'm, I, I know when a question arises, why it, it arose. And so for me, I personally divide my time between being really connected to certain projects as a design director and then larger strategic initiatives at the firm level. I actually reserve my Friday afternoons with um, a, a couple of different teams. And we literally talk about these kind of larger things. And Friday afternoon is a great place to be able to do that and kind of get a step outside of the, the work itself. And then there's also the how we are getting work and as a, you know, a market or um, a, a regional office or something like that. And so that we, we do kind of reserve sort of blocks of time for that. And um, not everybody wears all of those hats. For me right. personally, I think I mentioned I'm a generalist. I like all of them and I'm unwilling to give any one of them up. <laughs> so, um, could you give us an overview of the structure of, of Page and its scale at the moment? And then, sure. and then some of the differences between the kind of national offices that you have. Yeah. So prior to 2013, there's sort of a pre-13 and a, and a post because we really underwent this phenomenal change at that time. So Page, Sutherland Page, um, 
had uh, was a, more of a collection of kind of regional offices. And the intention behind PAGE was to create one firm, which we had been saying, but not really doing for, for some amount of years. And so the part of the tool to create that change versus just move beyond intention was to reorganize with based on market sectors versus purely these sort of regional offices. Right. And so certain of our markets, we actually do across the country in Mexico and the Middle East and Europe, and others are a little bit more regionally focused. But the, the work of knowledge share, the delivery of that, the um, pursuit of that work is now all happening at a national and more integrated level. And so that, that was a phenomenal change for us, just that shift from regional um, kind of business model to market sectors. And what it did is it allowed us to like exponentially learn from one another and then also work better with our clients and kind of serve their needs across. So that is how, you know, we're organized more now. We have um, probably between 650 and 700 people right now. Um, we're in a massive hiring mode as I think are many firms. So yes. that number will probably change by the time this comes out. But, um, but those are growing. And then the other piece of that is looking at, um, interestingly, how are our clients organized? What are their areas of growth? And, you know, sort of thinking about that from a, a kind of service place. So there are different characters to the office. There are different of the, all the different market sectors. If you were to look at a pie with each one as an equal amount of the market sectors, they, those shift in shape by office. The expertise in that office shifts or, or the, the amount of work in a particular area. But our goal is as one firm to, to increase that diversity across. Do, do, the, do the projects get allocated regionally then? So, you know, the, the, the Dallas firm office would be working on projects purely in that region, or do you find, you know, you've got one firm because they've got particular sector expertise, actually they're the best suited to be working on a project, which is, you know, even another in another country or another yeah. territory. It's not quite either <laughs> or, it's a little bit more both and. So right. for example, we have a core knowledge team for those. And then we will generally try and at least integrate some of that regional knowledge in so that we can deliver the difficult things of permitting wherever that is, or really have somebody who's you know, on site or who has those relationships, great relationships with contractors in that area. So we're really more looking at what's the best team. Sometimes that's 100% within the city or area. And sometimes it's, it's a smaller group that's in one area. Um, and so also we, we very much look at who do we want to grow and what knowledge do we want to grow? So if there are people that we want to teach about something, then we'll weave them into a team no matter where it is so that they can learn that skill or that project type. And, and in terms of kind of moving into new sectors, is that still a you know, a challenge or have you conquered that kind of maneuver or, you know, this is something often, often comes up with lots of architecture practices, no matter what scale you're at, still moving into a new sector can often be challenging. And uh, I suspect yeah. that you've, you've, you guys have had a lot of experience in being able to, to do that. And we have, you're right. I mean, there's so many different models for that. So there's the, the model of, we want to be able to do that thing. We're going to go buy a firm that does that thing. And that we've definitely done that. We've done that in a number of ways. And then the exercise is to weave in that knowledge into the firm and make sure that it is really sticky mm. and all of the client base and, and specificity of that has to then get pushed in to, to the larger firm and, and grow. And there, there are different challenges with that. Um, you hire someone for a certain level of expertise and then you are trying to get them to share it as much as possible. <laughs> the other way is growing more organically of saying those, that person has knowledge. We're going to bring that person in and let them teach and grow a team around them. And I, um, I think there isn't one of those that's necessarily better. 
I would say, you know, from, from the housing and hospitality group that I help lead, organic growth has been incredibly fruitful. We've been able to say that individual, whether it's a new design director or somebody who has got an expertise in delivery, has knowledge, has a, an ethos that is an ethos that we share. And we're not um, trying to kind of merge something that is really just based on a type of market. It's really the person as well kind of comes with that. So uh, that organic model, I think, has a lot of benefit to it as well in terms of long-term benefit to the health of the organization. Mm. How do you- and it takes longer. <laughs> Well, how do you how do you maintain institutional knowledge once you've acquired it? So, if you've got kind of uh, expertise in a certain realm or area, and some, maybe some of that expertise is kind of with a number of team members who perhaps have been in the office for kind of ten years plus, and then they then they leave, if you like. How do you kind of retain some of that experience or kind of kind of keep specialist expertise, if you like, or yeah. the knowledge really? Well, that's the word you, so we, we talk a lot about knowledge share and at the level at a, for the firm of our size, the fact that everybody is as collegial and open um, really surprises a lot of people. You know, they come here on day one and, and particularly in the Austin office, we, we can see 220 people. So that's a pretty big group to learn on day one, but after the first, you know, the first few weeks that somebody's here, they realize everybody is incredibly friendly. And this is not a place where they're hoarding their knowledge. Yeah. It is, is kind of the opposite. And, and so that one, it, that fundamental kind of idea that you are not, your knowledge is actually should be everybody's knowledge at any given time is, is incredibly important to just how we operate. Now we do that in some practical ways that are a little bit prescriptive. We have a lot of training that we do. We have groups that get together and talk about technical topics. Um, and then we'll have, we have a, a monthly call, for example, um, within our housing hospitality group. And we always pick a topic and we, we just let the team that knows the most share that with everybody else. Right. And, and so that kind of knowledge share, I think, Again, it's not rocket science. It just takes some intention behind it. And organize, yeah, and, and obviously organization to be able to, mm-hmm. to, to coordinate it. I, I understand that you are a employee owned business or there is stock options that are we, available. Yes. For- we are an ESOP and that conversation um, started also in 2014. It's a process that you go through. Um, it's a multi-layer you know, kind of transition in that um, employee stock plan and in terms of how things get vested. But the conversation with the firm really was that any individual success was the firm's success. And that also kind of comes back to our conversation about just proposals and understanding what our contracts look like and understanding that everybody is a part of the success of the firm at, at any level. So how, how does the, the ESOP um, work in your in your company? Do people kind of they they buy into it, or is it part of the kind of pay package? Or it's it's set up as an automatic um, withdrawal and contribution, and then the firm matches that, and then we do um, reports of you know the value of that stock and and what those uh, contributions have looked like and what those kind of longer distributions are. So it's a it's an individual contribution, and it's a firm match into that. Got it. Is it is it the the company still private or is it is it was it floated? It's private. It's mm-hmm. Private. Okay. Mm-hmm. And and how does the how do the valuations operate or work? Well, there that are um, there are voting shares. So we have a board, and that is a certain um, class of stock. There well, there's one class of stock that is principals and senior principals, hmm. and then of that, the senior principals are our board. Um, and then we have our a second class of stock um, that is our um, ESOP stock, and those are um, they have a different valuation. Got it. And in in terms of the the culture of the business, you're saying that 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 migration happened around 2014. Um, how has it changed the culture, and how how does it kind of uh, yeah 
Yeah, it's, I would say that it is incredibly empowering. Um, it's one of the things that is so exciting to see because we have, we have younger associates. We have people who have been out of school for a couple of years and they're bringing in projects. They're saying like, well, I have this wow. client, this person I went to school with, they're now working for so-and-so and should we be talking to them? And um, I feel like there's this idea that everybody should be talking about work and finding people who are a good fit for us. And um, we also do a lot of, um, I would call it pro bono and low bono work. We feel like it's incredibly important to invest in our community. And that is also our, our teams get a lot of um, food from mm. that, from being able to get back. And so we also encourage that as well. Um, we do a lot of service and then we do a lot of projects as service. And so um, helping the team to really understand what that model looks like and whether we're, we're decreasing our fee or whether we're donating our fee and how they can feed into that as a way to still create a healthy and successful financial business to make sure that we always understand that there's a, re a very important component to us of that other side. How does, you know, when, you, when you've got to a company at, at your scale, how do you maintain communication between the other hub, the other hubs, if you like, or the other offices? Do you guys kind of deliberately mix together or is there a, a moment in the year where all the offices kind of come together or, or, or is it or, or a team members interchangeable? People find themselves working in Austin and then they'll be traveling out to uh, another, another office. How does that work? I would say D all of the above. Um, <laughs> it's um, you know, we, we started an initiative about um, three or four years ago that was very intentionally, we call it page one. And it's what does that look like at every component? What does it look like at our billing rates, how we recruit and retain, you know, all of those different things. How does working as one firm manifest itself in every single thing that we do? Right. And so that then leads to all kinds of things. We have working groups that are looking at mentoring programs that happen across the firm. So there are people from all the offices and they're working together to make sure that we are creating models of, of sharing knowledge that work at all kinds of scales, like a six person cohort or a 30 person training. So those are not happening from like the one office trickle down, but it's bringing people from all the offices together to create those models. And it's really important to have that because a smaller office that might be newer, you know, that has, you know, maybe 30 or 40 people in it still has a really strong voice in how we're setting up those systems. So that's one way that we do that. We have, um, we have monthly meetings where we do um, kind of all hands and we don't have 700 people on that. Although we did have a new year's Eve party. Um, thank you, COVID for helping us create um, a social structure for that many people. Um, it was really interesting to kind of learn how we would do that um, and, and what technology and tools allow that to happen and really embracing those versus, you know, being afraid of them. It's kind of an interesting exercise. So I think we use a lot of digital sort of platforms for that. We, we, use, we use Teams to you know, have just a kind of online chat and continuously share knowledge. Some things that are really as fundamental as how our Revit models are hosted so that teams can just easily together work in the same model and not have technology be a barrier to collaboration. So we definitely have that technical component because you can have all the good intentions in the world and be able to pick up the phone and have a conversation. But at the end of the day, if doing the work with another office is a headache, yeah. it will, it will just, it will thwart all of your goodwill. And so we have a technology backbone that makes that um, share of files and digital platform as, as easy as it can. Uh, you, you mentioned there as well, you know, recruit and retain. And that's obviously one of the biggest pain points for, for many businesses. Obviously, there's a kind of building boom that's happening at the moment. Everybody is looking for, 
for new team members and attracting talent and you know the, the, the churn can be difficult. What, what's the process that you guys go through in terms of being able to find the right people for the right jobs or, or make sure that they're a kind of company fit as well and also yeah. nurturing that talent so they don't leave too soon? Yeah. Well, it's a great question. And I know it's one we're all facing. So the first thing we do is that we reach out to our employees and we let them know who we are looking for, why we're looking for them, what what kind of a fit we need. It's back to that component of saying like our success in recruiting and retaining is really benefiting all the staff who are there. And so that's one of the first places that we go to is to our staff and really even their like alumni networks and, and those kinds of things. So that's, that's one place that we go. And then we, um, the interview process, you know, is, is multi-layered. I, I think there was a, I think it was the New York Times or it might have been the Wall Street Journal that wrote an article a couple of years ago about how the interview is like the worst way to actually know if somebody is going to be a good fit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we try and structure our interviews in ways that we're, we're um, having conversations about what people's motivations are, what they care about. One of my questions always is, you know, making sure that we are not we are not accidentally having a conversation that uh, gives somebody an idea that we are something we're not. We really try and make sure that we're as clear as we can be about who we are and what we're looking for so that somebody doesn't come with the wrong idea and doesn't expect that they'll be doing something that they won't be doing here. I think that's one of the keys to retaining is being really, really clear about what we are looking for and what we need and what success looks like for us. People, you know, one of the things that has been a learning for me in the last few years is I used to have this idea that if everything was very egalitarian, that people would be happier and the sort of flattened hierarchy would lead to better collaboration. And it's been such an interesting human interest exercise for me to learn that people do, there is an ambition People, there are people who are professionally ambitious and they, they want to feel as though they are advancing. And while the word, you know, egalitarian sounds kind of great in a way yeah. that yeah. it also makes people feel like, well, how do I know I'm growing and how do I know I'm achieving my professional goals and I have professional goals and is that wrong here? And so that's been really interesting too. So Paige has actually spent a lot of time creating um, a communication piece about what professional development looks like and how we value people um, and their growth and what does it mean to have a ripple effect that goes beyond your individual work to a team, to an office, to a structure. And so that's something that we feel has actually been really important to recruiting and retention is showing people that they can grow. That's really interesting. Uh, and it, it leads on to a, a question about leadership and, and how do you identify leadership and, and kind of in, encourage it? Yeah, I think that, um, oh, go ahead. You weren't finished. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's okay. the Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting about um, the difference between leadership and management yes. is, is management feels as though it's trying to keep a thing going very stably in the same direction. And there's absolute value in that, that type of management, really keeping, keeping the wheels on the road, so to speak. Leadership has, to me, a greater component of saying, here's where we should be going. And I am willing to go there. And even if it's going to be a little bit different along the way, and even if there might be a little bit of a boat wake because it's not just going in a straight line. And so one of the things that we do encourage is for people to take that ownership and not be afraid mm. to go somewhere and to, to take that ownership and to ask that difficult question and to kind of poke on something. And the people who are willing to do that and to go beyond what they're doing on their project and, and, and create or obligate us to create a benefit outside of that, those people you you can really see. I mean, they have a light on, and and we definitely um, 
they're not the easiest ones. I mean, that's the thing. I think great leaders are not necessarily the easiest going people. <laughs> they're not about keeping it all, you know, smooth. Um, they're about creating energy, and um, and that that's something that we we definitely value. In your in your own career trajectory, what have been some of your biggest lessons in and around leadership and your own leadership style? Well, one of the things that you probably can tell at the <laughs> through this is that I really do believe in communication. Um, I just feel like if if nothing else in the world, we should be able to sit down and say, there's something difficult or challenging or interesting that we need to have a conversation about. So I think for me, um, it will, it always comes down to, to that. I did have an incredibly important and interesting personal moment about my role as, as a leader and as a female in the profession. And it was kind of in that 2014 time frame, there was a, um, my generation, um, you know, sort of just as a human was more of the do good work, work really hard yep. and the right things will happen. Don't ask necessarily probing questions. Don't create a, a separate table for yourself. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, work hard. And, and that's, um, you know, largely sort of my approach. And I didn't ever want to be at a, a women's table. Even when I had a small firm, I was very resistant to filing as a woman owned or minority owned business because I was like, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to be the, the thing that I, I um, am looking for. Yes. But the equity by design survey that came out um, in, from the San Francisco chapter of the AIA and that group, Rosa Chang's been, uh, she's amazing. That um, data that came out coincided with a fantastic exhibit at the Texas Society of Architects Conference um, that happened to be in Houston. And the Houston chapter of the AIA made an exhibit, the history of women in architecture, 1858 to the present. Wow. And there were people, I mean, it was a gorgeous wall. It was 80 feet long. It was totally immersive. And it had these women that I should have known, or they had done things that I knew their name, but I didn't know everything they had done. And seeing that, which I just gives me chills on my head thinking about it, um, and reading the data of the fact that many graduating classes were like mine, it was 55% female graduating from my um, architecture program led to, you know, 18 to 28% of licensure, but only led to, you know, three to 10% of, you know, women in leadership of firms. That gap made me feel like oh, I really actually owe the profession some additional work in this area. I have a personal responsibility and I can't just think that I'm going to work hard and kind of work my way through and the right thing will happen because clearly the right thing isn't happening. As yeah. much as I didn't want to acknowledge that, the data was terrible. So that really led to me and, um, you know, getting together with colleagues and talking about, you know, well, what does success look like and why aren't we there? And what are some of the fundamental underpinnings? And there's not just one. It's very complex. But how can we begin to kind of break down and address those issues? And how can I, as an individual, or as a collective, begin to address some of these things? And how can I not just do it at my firm level, but at a, a kind of larger community level? So right. that was really empowering. And I, I feel very proud of my colleagues and the work that we've done and the work of of AIA and, and really all, a lot of professional organizations were kind of, the light was coming on, you know, at a similar time. So you ask what that looks like. It, it actually looks like not just hoping for good things to happen, uh, but to do some work along the way. How, how do you see the future in this, in this sense, and particularly with kind of um, women in, in leadership positions in, in architecture? Is it, is it improving? Have we still got a long way to go? I, again, it's a little bit of both. We are improving and we still have a long way to go. And, 
you know, one of the things that is interesting is the room, so to speak, our client groups are, it's really interesting to look at what does our client per, um, population look like. So there are certain projects where uh, we just finished a hotel um, about a year and a half ago, and the client was a, a woman, the contractor was a woman, I led the design team, and it was, and the, even the brand creation was led by a female director. I mean, that, that team, which was a very diverse team and had lots of um, a men on it, but but the the leadership was all female. And that was the first time I'd really seen that level because so many times you walk into a room of developers and there are 20 men yeah. and, and like one woman, you know? And so public projects are a little bit different. Um, so I think that we're making headway, not just in what the firms look like, but what our clients look like. And, you know, one of the things I think that, is been very good about the conversation about diversity is that it's not just diversity of, of the human, but of diversity of thought and really appreciating that, that design, that good design actually comes from a diversity of thought and that that's a, a slightly different way of thinking about what you're trying to do as a goal and creating that team. Brilliant. Love it. And and just to kind of conclude, what's the rest of 2021 got in store for you? Well, one of the things I'm very, very passionate about is that the work that we do should lead to success and community. And so we have this, you know, Austin is growing like crazy. So many of the cities that we're working in, we're dealing with affordability and we're dealing with gentrification and we're thinking about how can the place that we love, that people are flocking to, um, both be innovative, but also maintain those fantastic kernels of knowledge? And so we are working on a number of projects where the, the, what success looks like is that the community, the ripple effect of the project is really intentionally talked about at every stage. So we're looking at um, a project right now where our our like internal goal is that we're looking at a, a regional community maker for every single part of the project before we look outside to see if we can increase the business success of the maker community by virtue of building a development in that um, kind of area. So thinking about community and thinking about health in a lot of ways is um, one of the things I'm most excited about right I now. Love it. Brilliant. Amazing. I think it's the perfect place for us to conclude. You've been absolutely brilliant in sharing your expertise and your um, career path. And just want to say a massive thank you for joining us this afternoon. Massive thank you to you too. I have enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Dot com, or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you Conquer the world. Carpe diem.